Guys, welcome to Box to Box, the football talk show powered by Sports Audio TV. My name's Uni. Uh, before I talk about the show, uh, I want to thank you guys for liking, subscribing, and doing whatever you can to support the channel. Keep doing that for us. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, share. Also, like our social media content um, and also our social media pages, which are going to be down there for you guys below. The links are down there for you guys below. So keep supporting us. We do aim to get on big guests for you guys talking football, boxing and MMA, UFC. Uh, so definitely just keep on supporting us and we will provide you with great stuff. Now, let's talk about the show. Before we go to our guest this week, uh, I want to do a quick recap on the weekend's football and also talk about some breaking news. So let's go into that. Now, going forward, I want to talk about two English young stars who are in the papers for the right and wrong reasons. First of all, Mason Greenwood uh, seems to be in the papers again. The Times are reporting that Man United are questioning his application in training. Um, we know that Mason Greenwood's been in the media limelight for the last couple of months, especially after Gareth Southgate sent him home, after him and Phil Foden broke uh, COVID regulations when they flew out for an international game. Um, but at this present time, there's a story coming out saying that he's not applying himself. Uh, he was also dropped from the squad um, this weekend, but I think Oli said that he was unwell. Um, there's also something come out in the mirror saying that Bruno Fernandes wasn't happy with Mason Greenwood's um, lacklustre performance in training on Friday. It seems a bit of a tough one. It seems like the media like to pick uh, one player, uh, an English player, and sort of hunt him down with Mason Greenwood. He's a young star. He's doing great things in football last season. He broke many records and potentially can keep on breaking records in the future. But it seems like there's a hunt for him. Um, there's rumours always coming out that this is going on with Mason Greenwood. And that's, that's going on with Mason Greenwood. But uh, only the club know, only he knows what's going on. And I'm sure there'll be enough ex-players that are close to the club that can contact him to help him out if he is in any of these situations. And the only thing I've got to say about the media is they've done the same with Raheem Sterling in the past. They've hunted him even though he's been great for communities, he's been great for football, he's been performing as well. Um, maybe they've got bored of sort of doing that to Raheem Sterling and now picking on Mason Greenwood. We don't know, uh, but I hope if Mason is having any problems, um, you know, he can get him sorted out. He's a young, he, he's a young star, there's huge pressure on him. He's at the biggest club in the world in Manchester United. And we don't know if the pressure's got to him, but you know what? There's a lot of fans out behind him. There's a lot of people that are behind him that can help him. And hopefully he gets it sorted out if there is a problem. And you know what? Carries on performing the way he does because for me, he is one of the best finishers in the league. And he will be a great asset to that English football club. Um, and secondly, I want to talk about another one. Uh, someone who rejected Manchester United in the summer or a couple of months ago in Jude Bellingham. Jude Bellingham moved to Borussia Dortmund and now has been called to the England team. Jude Bellingham got called up because James Ward-Prowse and Trent Alexander-Arnold have had to pull out the England team. And it seems a bit of a strange one for me. He's only played five games, I think, for Borussia Dortmund, but gets called up, which is good. I, I support any um, young English players getting called up, but I hope it's not too early for him. I hope, you know, he seems like a player who can play under pressure, but uh, we don't know, he, you know, it still seems very early in his career to be called for, called up for England when there's certain players that have been playing in the league for a long time that haven't been called up. Um, but yeah, good luck to him, you know, great achievement. Uh, and let's see how he gets on, he might not even start, but let's see how he gets on just being around the England camp and I'm sure that'll be great experience for him at this young age. Um, let's go and talk about some of the games that happened on the past weekend, some of the the big news and let's start off with Southampton, one of the most talked about teams in the Premier League, uh, Ralph Hasselhunt, the manager has got them playing the way he's wanted them to play. It's been, it's always been the talking point that they've improved since that battering that they took from Leicester and it, it just seems that it's working. Whatever Ralph Hasselhunt has, has implemented in his team seems to be working. They all seem to be pushing forward as a team and defending as a team. Um, I was so surprised in the summer transfer window that nobody took Danny Ings. Great striker. He's shown he can do it for England as well. He's doing it for Southampton. I know he's obviously been injured and you know been out of the team. But great player. This weekend we saw Che Adams, che Adams score a goal as well. Uh, we got James Ward-Prowse. Theo Walcott seems to be a good signing for these guys. And it seems the defenders seem to be a bit more... Uh, 
tough, stronger this season, and it seems that the team's playing as a team. Right? It seemed that when they were fighting for the relegation battle, that there was individuals playing, but it wasn't a team. But I think Ralph Hasselhunt, the great manager that he is, has got his team playing. They are third in the league. They are scoring goals. They, you know, it's a routine win against Newcastle, and Newcastle could have given them problems, but it showed how good the team Southampton are. So let's see how that one carries out because it has been a crazy season so far. But next up, I want to talk about Chelsea Football Club. Chelsea seem to be on a high at the moment, scoring goals, defending well um, in the last couple of games, especially after the draw to United, to Manchester United. Um, they've scored 14 goals, uh, which is a massive number of goals. Um, people like Hakim Ziyech or performing Ziyech is is a player that I've always thought why I've always thought a big club would come in for him. Chelsea eventually got him, and it's just baffled me how a player has gone for such a short, cheap price. But everyone saw in Europe what he could do. He could. He works for the team, works very hard for the team, up and down the team. He's got loads of speed on him. He's great vision in regards to assists. He's got a good final ball on him, so you know he's going to get assists, going to get goals. And he's doing that now in the last couple of games. He's shown by scoring goals, assisting. Uh, we know that Timo Werner is getting into his own now. He's he's slowly, slowly getting there, getting the goals that he needs. Uh, Kai Havertz may be taking a bit longer than usual, but you know he is a great talent. And I'm sure playing in that number 10 role or, or wherever he plays, just behind the striker, that is going to benefit him. Uh, but we've got to talk about the back line. The back line was Chelsea's... A question mark this season. They signed Thiago Silva and the last first first game wasn't great for him. We know that. Now they've got Edward Mendy, it seems that the back four, back five seems to be so stable. Edward Mendy not con conceded one goal now uh, this past weekend gone. Um, Silva along with Kurt Zuma seems to be a great partnership at the moment. It seemed that Kurt Zuma needed somebody as experienced as Thiago Silva to lead the line and help him out and it seems like it's working. Ben Chilwell, another great player on the left and Rhys James uh, proving that you know what, he's worthy of the right, right back spot. So let's see how Chelsea get on this year. There was a lot of pressure on Frank uh, Lampard to perform this season, especially with the signings he's made. And so far so good, it seems like slowly, slowly they're coming into their own. So let's see how that one works out. Next up, we've got to talk about Leicester, who are on top of the league. Um, this weekend they beat Wolves 1-0. Could have been a tough game for them, but they, they played really well. They've, they seem to sign the right players Leicester do. Seem to sign the right players, especially defenders. We saw on the weekend that the, the, the French signing uh, Wesley Fontana from Saint Etienne was a beast of a player. He stopped everything coming towards him. Um, and he's been touted for the last as, as the last 12 months I've seen his name on social media along with uh, William Saliba who's gone all over to Arsenal um, these were the names coming out of France who people were picking out as potential stars and it seems like Leicester have another star they seem to do this with defenders and with any player that they buy uh, we saw it with Harry Maguire who did great things uh, for Leicester, moved on to Manchester United, uh, Johnny Evans, Sergek, we've got uh, Von Fana at this present time, Tillisman, who's performing again, we've got James Madison, Mendy, that midfield itself seems to be working and then you've got the veteran but someone who just produces season on season is Jamie Vardy. People might not like him, I don't know if people don't like him because he's British or what he might be, but he's a fantastic player, I'd have him in my team all day long. Someone who gives defenders problems, scores goals consistently. He's done it ever since, he's done it for the last couple of seasons. A regular goal scorer. Uh, but yeah, I've got to take my hats off um, to the recruitment team. They seem to be signing players that are working for them. And let's see how they get on because we know last season they faltered towards the end of last season. They should have been in the top four. They faltered, Man United nicked it. Well, United came third, Chelsea came fourth. But let's see how strong Leicester are this season. They're proving to be a great team once again this season. Next up, let's talk about Mourinho. Mourinho's Tottenham Hotspurs. Uh, another win, 1-0 uh, in the 80th minute. Not as, conv as convincing as wins in the, in the past weeks. Um, but when it comes to Mourinho, everyone talks about Mourinho being a boring manager. He's a defensive manager, he parks the bus. Bloody, bloody, blood. This season, we've seen that he's got a team that he wants, or partially got a team that he he, was, he wants, and they scored 19 goals this season. They won goal less than Chelsea, who are the top scorers in the league this season with 20. Um, 
so he's showing that he's he's getting his attacking side right. Harry Kane's been phenomenal. I think Harry Kane's the best striker in the Premier League. He's probably the best striker in Europe at the moment. He's absolutely phenomenal. He's actually showing a different side to his game this season, making a lot of assists. His passing ability. I didn't I didn't know how great his passing was until I saw him uh, saw him with some of the assists this season. 30, 40 yard passes to Son, who's been another great player, who just latches onto a great ball and scores. It's just them two together seems to be the great. It seems to be the great portion to uh, the attacking side for Mourinho. Um, I think Mourinho still needs to work on that defense, but it seems to be working. They're winning games, and as long as they keep on attacking, they'll they'll do well. But they've signed a great left back in Regulon. Um, Will Real Madrid come back in for him and just take him and stop, and stop next summer? We don't know because there's a buyback clause there. He's been phenomenal. Gareth Bale has still got to come back um, and sort of show his full fitness. So we don't know yet, but he is seem seemingly there or thereabouts. And another player, Endon Bile, somebody who had question marks over him last season. Uh, I think Mourinho gave him the harsh treatment, gave him a bit of the kick up the ass. And it's worked. He's been phenomenal this season. Some of the games I've seen this season, he's been great. So it seems that Mourinho could actually be uh, one, of the, one of the guys pushing for the title. We don't know. It's still early days. Maybe not title, but maybe top four. And next up, we've got to talk about none other than Aston Villa. This weekend, they faced Arsenal. Arsenal coming off that great win against Manchester United. Uh, watching Sky Sports after that game, it seemed that Arteta couldn't do anything wrong. Um, then come a week later, and it seems like they just capitulated. And I don't want to take anything away from Aston Villa. They were great on the day. They just put Arsenal on the back foot, and it just seemed like we saw a bit of the old Arsenal then, where they mentally folded, um, and they were lucky not to concede more than three goals. Jack Grealish, I've got to give uh, Tim hats off to him, being an absolutely immense player this season as well. Carried on his form and make an even better this season, performing in the big games. Was great against Liverpool when they beat him 7-2. And now, again, was one of the most pivotal players when just last week when they beat Arsenal. Um, another great signing has been Ross Barkley, I've got to give it to him. He's been a good player, he's been a good player for Everton, a good player for Chelsea, but We've not got to see the level of consistency that we've seen so far. It's only eight games in. It's only the start, and he only started. He only signed at the last day, so he's only played a couple of games. It's very early days, but what I'm seeing so far is good. He's he's been great for the team, and when you've got somebody as well like uh, Martinez, who was signed from Arsenal, you've got Sir Pedro and so Aston Villa seem uh, they might be doing bits this season. Dean Smith has got his boys playing, and finally. Man City, Liverpool finished 1-1 um, and I just feel like Man City had the chance to win that game. We know uh, De Bruyne missed, missed the opportunity with a penalty that he dragged wide which was quite shocking to me. I thought that would hit the back of the net but it didn't. Uh, so we know that even great players sometimes falter and that was the case. Um, but Liverpool came out strong with their attack. We know how great they are in the attack and they showed, you know what, that they are going to probably be the team that it's going to be, push, be pushing for the title. But City had chances in that game to win the game. And I feel like they were the one that could actually go ahead and think that they've dropped two points for that. Um, it's a tough one for uh, Pep at the moment because he's not picking up the points that he needs to be picking up. And if he, if this carries on, you know, they could they could be a gut building and we don't know how that will go on with the season. It's a bit of a crazy season. A very inconsistent season from a lot of teams. So we don't know how that is. But I do feel like Two points dropped by Man City, good point for Liverpool. Uh, but yeah, that was a recap and the breaking news this week. Myself and Ali Drew spoke to Johnny from Newcastle Fans TV about everything to do with Newcastle. So check that out. Guys, welcome to Box to Box, the football talk show powered by Sportsology TV. My name's Uni. That's my co-host, Ali Drew. Uh, this week, we've got another guest, someone who we spoke to in the past. But let me recap on last week. Uh, we spoke to the very funny, uh, self-proclaimed best hair in show business, Andy Goldstein, who spoke about uh, sort of the craziness that's happening in football, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, the sort of scrutiny that he's coming under, and, and everything else football-related. We're going to 
have a link for you guys somewhere. But if not, we've got a playlist with the box to box videos on there. So definitely click on there and just watch whatever you want. Also, make sure you like, subscribe, share, do what you can to support the channel. Uh, but Ali, this week we bring to you uh, someone we've known quite well. Yes, we've got a familiar face joining us on this episode of Box to Box. We are delighted to be joined by Newcastle Fans TV's Jonathan Greenwood. Jonathan, welcome back to the show. How are you? I'm very good. Thanks for having me on. Great to have you back. How is it? How has life been since we last saw you? Um, it's been all right. It's just been back at work, so being able to get a bit more normality back into my life. But um, yeah, it's it's been okay. It's been okay. Obviously, with the lockdown that we're in now, it's a bit strange again. But you just got to get on with life, haven't you? Jonathan, um, let's talk about football. Then let's talk about your beloved team. Probably not the best time to be talking about them. They've just come off a loss to Southampton. Um, talk to me about that game. We know that Southampton are soaring at the moment. They are in the top four. They're doing what they're doing and just unexpectedly just putting out these results. But let's talk about that specific game. Obviously, you're an avid uh, New Newcastle fan. Give me your reaction to that. It was very poor. It was very, very poor. Um, we, we started poorly and gave a sloppy goal away after about six or seven minutes where Miguel Almiron was holding up the ball too much and it allowed Theo Walcott to nip in and give it to Che Adams who put it past uh, Carl Dolo with uh, with a lot of force and we just never really recovered. We couldn't really string three passes together going forwards and Southampton's press was just too much for us to, really for the, the whole 90 minutes. Um, too many of our players had an off day and I, I think our first real proper chance was in the 88th minute of the game. So that tells you a lot about um, I think the annoyance of the Newcastle fans in terms of maybe tactics as well from Steve Bruce but it was probably one of the worst performances of the season even though it was 2-0 it was a 2-0 hammer and it could have easily been 5 or 6 Especially the way things are going this season with all the goals um, What I did like afterwards I'm sure obviously you wouldn't have done as a Newcastle fan but Southampton did you see that they tweeted to say stop the count that they were top <laughs> they were top of the league I just this season seems to be it's just all over the place. People are ha every, it seems every single team has an amazing game and then the next they have a terrible, terrible performance. Surprise, people beating, you know, it's, it's just all over the place this season. It's been a very strange season, hasn't it? Um, obviously, Aston Villa beating Liverpool by the way they did. Obviously, your Man Manchester United early as well with that game against Spurs, I think you're both my United fans, aren't you? Yeah, so, here we are. <laughs> yeah, I'll not mention what the score was between us and Man United, obviously. But um, <laughs> no, um, yeah, it's been crazy. Like we played Everton a couple of weeks ago, and Everton have had a fantastic start this season. And then if we had beaten Southampton, we would have been a point extra ahead. So it was really, really strange. But um, I don't think we'll ever see another Premier League season like this because obviously, with the fact there's no fans, it's it's just kind of allowed every team to kind of. Uh, I think do things that they would never have done maybe in previous seasons because the fans aren't putting the pressure on them but yeah I, I, I find it hard to believe like it's still like Leicester and Southampton are in the top four you've got Spurs that just come out of nowhere and they look half decent this season but um, yeah it's going to be strange this season I think I still think Liverpool will win it but um, it's good. it'll be definitely exciting you know, I was listening to Talk Sport uh, maybe towards the end of last season and they were I don't know who it was and they were saying that the guy was saying that this season might actually be a crazy season because the turnaround of games on the end of last season, then you got such a small break. Some teams were in Europe, United were in the Europa, and then you had just had what a couple of weeks off and then the season started again. People were basically playing the pre-season at the start of the Premier League. So even with United, the first three, four games, they were horrendous. And you could tell that they weren't fit. You know, they, they hadn't played much game time together. And we, you know we were lucky to get some of the results that we did. Uh, but looking back, looking at it now, when you put in sort of the effect of having no fans, it just seems so crazy that you know goals are going in, defenders are not performing. It's just it's a, it's like the weirdest season ever. But what I wanted to ask you, Johnny, is do you feel like this season can be that crazy that someone like an unexpected team, someone like Leicester, maybe again can win the league because the teams up there and this. A bit early in the season. We know that we're only eight games in. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But do you feel like it could be one of them seasons? I don't know if you'll see a, a team like a Leicester win the league, but it wouldn't surprise me if you see an unexpected team get into the top six or get into the top four. It, it just wouldn't surprise me anymore. Um, obviously, you've got the top six who 
obviously in European competition. Mm. And you've got Leicester as well, who are in the Europa League. So that can probably have a, a, a big effect on Leicester in particular. Um, but I, the cream always rises to the top. And you saw Liverpool last year were just extraordinary at times. And I know the majority of the season, they, they had already won the league really before COVID came about. But um, I don't know. You, you've got to keep an eye on like, so maybe Southampton, Aston Villa, Leicester to an extent. Uh, Everton, if they can get back onto a good run of form that they have done uh, at the start of the season, you could probably look at them four, possibly even throwing Wolves into that Spurs, mix. I put Spurs in there. I think Spurs might actually be might not even break into like, the might actually cause some havoc this year. Yeah, I like I consider Spurs more like obviously a top six team, so I kind of expect them to be fighting for okay. top four. Um, I, I think if Mourinho pulls off Spurs winning the league. I don't think you can even have an argument over Spurs as over Guardiola and Mourinho. I think Mourinho is there by himself yeah. if, if if he manages to pull that off. Um, do I think he will? I don't think he will know. I think he'll probably finish third or fourth. I think Liverpool Man City are still a little bit too uh, good. And especially defensively, I think Spurs might get caught out. But look, it, it's if Spurs can if Spurs pull it off, it'd be I think it wouldn't be as big of a shock as the Leicester one for obvious reasons, but I don't think it'd be that far off because because Spurs have never really won the league, have they? They've only I think they've only won it twice in their history. So um, it'd be interesting to see how they get on, especially with Mourinho. He's just he's just he's just a crazy character, isn't he? Johnny, you've never mentioned all their names, but you never mentioned that Man United are going to win the league this season. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got I actually got a question. I'm, my, <laughs> I'm doing an Instagram uh, Q and A at the moment. Someone asked me, "Will United finish top four?" I said, "No, we're going to win the league," and that's because of Adam McCullough. He's got me on this. He's got it in my head, so I blame Adam McCullough for that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, um, Ali, I know Ali wants to talk to you about sort of the key players and some of their performances this season. Yes, so you know, obviously there's, you know, there's been some up and down performances for Newcastle, but some players have sort of stood out. You know, I think Ryan Fraser maybe has a little bit of an injury at the moment. Do you think that he's one of the sort of main players? And, and do you know if, you know, he's going to be, they've got a little bit of a break now until the next game, but do you think that he's sort of one of the main key players for Newcastle? We haven't seen a lot of him, Alex, to be honest. Um, he came to Newcastle unfit, not because he, he was yeah. practically unfit, he just hasn't played a lot of football. So it took him about three or four games, like in the cup competitions, the kind of... When he's playing, though, he's, he's, I think he's important to, to the team. He's very important. He's very important. And I think the partnership he has with Callum Wilson, you like to think that you can replicate that at Bournemouth, from what he did at Bournemouth to Newcastle. And they've showed glimpses of it, um, obviously with the second goal against Everton um, a couple of weeks ago. It was Wilson, uh, Fraser at Wilson, straight in the back of the net too. Now Newcastle can kind of relax a little bit. Um, he, he is going to be important for us. He's important for Scotland. He he was rumoured to a lot of big clubs uh, in the summer um, and pre-lockdown as well. So look, Newcastle got, a, on the basis of it, a very, very good deal because a free signing for a quality player like Ryan Fraser, um, if he can get a run of, obviously, a run of form in the team when he's fit, hopefully, I don't think he's out for too long. He might even be back for the game against... I think we've got Chelsea, Chelsea a week on Saturday. Yeah. yeah, so we've got Chelsea a week on Saturday. Um, if Fraser's back, Wilson might miss one game potentially. So he might be back for the game after that. So, um, yeah, Ryan Fraser is very important um, because we haven't really got a lot of better options when you look at, say, Alan St. Maximum, Jacob Murphy's done okay since he's been brought back into the team. So Ryan Fraser is probably the best out of them three. Um, so if he's kept fit then hopefully Newcastle can have a good season. And Thanks. talk to me about Callum Wilson as well. He's obviously, he is, he's, he's doing well. He's, you know, he's scoring goals. He's, he's performing. He is six goals in the Premier League this season and didn't get an England call up, um, which I was amazed by, but probably yeah. from a Newcastle point, he wouldn't have been able to play for England, obviously because of the injury, but um, it's probably good for Newcastle in, in a selfish way because there's no more international breaks until I think March so he's going to get four months hopefully playing for Newcastle um, and I think if Callum Wilson plays another four months for Newcastle we're not going to be involved in any relegation battle in my opinion because I think he will score enough goals um, it's just whether or not he'll get the service and you hope if Fraser fit, Fraser's fit and St Maxim can get his form back mm. then we can get the, uh, get the goals from but he's a hell of a player how he didn't get an England call up I'll never know but um, when you've got players that have not even scored a Premier League goal this season or scored one goal this season in the Premier League and they've managed to get an England call-up. So, uh, a bit bemused by that one. You know what? There's a lot of question marks over Southgate over some of the calls that he's made. Even with like someone that I rate very, very highly and he's doing it again this season, Jack Grealish. 
it just seems like yeah he gets called up but he doesn't seem to be, he for me Jack Grealish is good enough to be put into that England team to fight with anyone because this season he's been phenomenal um, but yeah Southgate seems to pick players he's picked like I'm a United fan Harry Maguire's not been great but Harry Maguire gets into the England team even though he's had a poor season so sometimes you've got to question what you know the sort of uh, the structure that he's got in place to pick his players and pick the squad uh, but uh, I want to talk about another signing, and I spoke to you when the signings all happened, and these three big signings that came in all in one goal. Uh, Jamal Lewis, another uh, another signing from Norwich that came in. Talk to me about the impact that he's had this year. I think he's done pretty well since he's come in. Um, he's definitely a lot more better going forward than he is defending. I think that hopefully will come in time. Um, he, he has got a good cross in him, and that's what Newcastle have been lacking desperately, is a good cross from a full-back. We've had like some Javier Mancu who just can't cross a ball. Uh, DeAndre Yedlin has one good cross a season. It, it, we just lacked it. Lacked a very good crosser of the ball because we had some good players in terms of our attacking positions. We've had Ron Don in the past um, who, if he had a bit more better, so he might have scored another three or four goals this season. Um, and I think Callum Wilson needs, obviously, the deliveries of uh, full-backs to try and nick a couple of goals this season. So that was, I think going forward, he is a threat and he played a fantastic pass for Fraser for the for Fraser to then get, uh, give the ball to Wilson against Everton. So, attacking-wise, I've got n- no real qualms about him at all. It's just defensively, I'm not too sure. I think I was worried against Wolves when Traore was brought on. I thought, well, he might get the better of him, but he did okay. I just think positionally, he gets it. The fact that he's had to play four, then a five at the back, that can be tough uh, transition, but he's done okay. Um, I just like, like I, I'd like to think that Steve Bruce could probably get the best out of him yeah. um, by trying to basically one-on-one teach him defensively, um, especially against very attacking wingers and very quick wingers because you're going to get a lot of them in the Premier League nowadays. Your next game, obviously against Chelsea, I think it's on Saturday 21st, there's a little bit of a break. Um, Do you think that break's good, obviously coming off the loss to Southampton? And how do you think that Newcastle, sort of, how do you think they can, can beat Chelsea? You know, what do they need to do? Especially with the Chelsea team that are firing at the moment. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I think to answer your first question, um, it has come at a good time because of the injuries that we've had that we've mentioned before. Um, the performance against Southampton wasn't great, and I think probably it gives Newcastle fans two weeks to kind of forget about that. And Chelsea's going to be a very, very tough game. Um, obviously, they spent a heck of a lot of money. Um, how can Newcastle beat them? They're going to have to play exceptionally well, and Chelsea are going to have a bit of an off have to have a bit of an off day. You look at the likes of Pulisic, um, Hakim Ziyech, I'm just trying to think who else, Tammy Abraham, Mason Mount, you know, the list is endless. They've got some fantastic players and um, you, you, I think defensively it's always been Chelsea's Achilles heel. They've obviously gotten the goalkeeper Mendy. I don't think he's considered a goal yet. So obviously Newcastle are going to score at least two or three past them, maybe. Um, <laughs> but no, I, it's, we've got to just take our chances. We're not going to get a great deal of um, amount of chances, but you never know if Newcastle get the first goal. Stranger things have happened. We've actually got a pretty good record against Chelsea at St. James's. I think we've only won one in the last 10, 12 years, maybe, maybe two. So we've actually haven't got a bad record um, against, against Chelsea. But um, if you're offering me a point right now, I'll take it with both hands. Thank you very much. But with, after the Chelsea game, we haven't got one of the top six teams until Boxing Day. So you'd like to think Newcastle can pick up a few points and say, I don't know, by Boxing Day, what, we're on 11 points now. If we can get so many of the 20-point mark by Boxing Day, because I think there's a good four or five games after that, then you'd have to consider that as a very good start of the season with a, a cup quarter-final on the way as well. So, yeah, I'd, I'd take a point against Chelsea, but we're going to have to be defensively solid and not concede silly goals that like we did against Southampton. Johnny, I know it's early in the season and we've been, I've spoken to yourself two, three times in the past as well. Uh, but just give us your sort of general sort of analysis so what your sort of reaction to the season so far what, what's been the good side of the season and what's been the bad side from, from, from your team um, I think obviously we've, the games that we've won we've actually played pretty well I know that sounds stupid because sometimes you can <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. still play awful but win games but um, I think for me the fact that we've got a goal scorer in Callum Wilson and he has done so well it's helped us massively because last year we had Joe Linton he hasn't, he hasn't scored he hasn't, I think he's got two Premier League goals. So we're, we're crying out for a centre forward. And the fact that we've got one who can put the ball in the back of the net and it literally can just literally 
basically help a team in so many different ways is a massive plus. Um, I think the negative side, I think Steve Bruce, there's some games I think he's very tactically naive and my, my, my problem with Steve Bruce is I don't think he has a plan A, never mind a plan B with Newcastle. He's been there nearly 18 months and I still don't know, don't think he knows what his best team is, what his best formation is. Um, and you'd like to think when you look at other managers who have been in the club's similar time periods, they seem to have got a bit of an identity. Southampton's a perfect example. Hassan Hoople's been there, I think, maybe, maybe just under a year more than Steve Bruce. Dean Smith at Aston Villa, similar amount of time. Um, Brendan Rodgers, Lester's. I know maybe Lester's probably a bad example because they've, they've got a better squad on paper, but at least you know what their ideas are. At least you know what their plan A is, is going to be and what their plan B is going to be. Um, with Newcastle, you don't know who the first choice centre-half pairing is if we go four at the back. You don't know who's going to be playing centre midfield. Um, who's going to be on the wing. Does Al Niron get put out on the wing where we all know he's a good number 10? There's a lot of questions to be asked, but push come to shove, if we need a result, Steve Bruce seems to get out of the bargain. That Wolves game, we've got a point when we shouldn't have got a point, really. Um, that Spurs, Spurs game, how we've got a point against Spurs, I'll never know. Um, so we'll just have to wait and see what happens. But if we can get a little bit better going in terms of the tactics and Newcastle can pick up a few better performances then yeah I'll be pretty happy well, what's, what's a realistic goal for yourself putting on not putting on the crazy hat that I put on earlier and said we're going to win the league what's, what's the sort of realistic goal as a Newcastle fan with the team that you've got with non-Saudi sort of owners you've just got the normal Mike Ashley in, in charge of you the have to bring that up <laughs> <laughs> so yeah go on tell me what, what would you think this season is it um, for yourself well, we, we spoke with Pete Graves, uh, who works for Sky a couple of weeks ago, and he said that Newcastle should be about 10th. That's about par. Anything better is brilliant. Anything worse, we could do better. And I think I have to agree with him. I think 10th, 11th, I think Newcastle can get there because look at so many teams now. You look at, I think, obviously, I think we're just above yourselves at the minute, but I think from Man United. I have to get to, that in there. <laughs> well, I have to, I have it's not going to be too much longer that we're going to get that. Um, I'll take that in mind, but uh, <laughs> no. But if you look at if you look at the same where Man United are to say where Leicester are, I think there's only about eight points. So yeah. Newcastle potentially could get into the top half if they can get a bit of form. But alternatively, if we don't pick up results, we could end up in a, a bit of bother. But uh, to, uh, we're 13th at the minute, and I think we could be end up 13th, 12th or 13th again this season. I don't think Newcastle. Are, I think there's too many teams that are probably better than Newcastle. Um, in, in likes of like Aston Villa, Everton, Southampton Wolves. I think even Crystal Palace are probably better than us this season. So I think we'll probably finish around about 12th, 13th again. But it, is that a good season for Newcastle? In terms of the hierarchy, it's a good season. It's another season in the Premier League for Newcastle fans. 12th, 13th is not too bad. But can we get into the top 10? I think if we finish if we finish 10th or higher, I'll be over the moon. But it's, it's amazing that two or three little places can make such a difference. But... um. Yeah, I'll, I'll put my neck out on the line. I'll say Newcastle can finish in the top half if Wilson and Fraser are fit and are firing. If they're not, it'll be about 12th or 13th, I think. Well, you, we just mentioned, obviously, that the takeover didn't happen. Um, it's all sort of come back up at the moment. It's in the, in the news, the sort of the talk of the takeover. What is the sort of latest with that? Like, why is it suddenly... Because I presume it's still not going to happen. It, it's, I don't know why it's sort of suddenly back can you can you go into a little bit more detail on that um i don't think any takeover with newcastle will go away until it's done um to be brutally honest with you i think i think there will always be rumors um amanda stavey's not going away quietly that's basically all you need to know i think she wasn't very happy that this that the premier league took four months to make a decision the saudis lost patience and thought we're not we're not sticking around for this um but obviously Mike Ashley obviously got his lawyers involved to try and basically sue the Premier League over it and say, well, why, why can you not accept this deal? We've given you the relevant information. Now, you'd like to think Newcastle and the Premier League can settle this out of court. They've just got in, um, Nick, I think it's called Nick DeMarco QC, yeah. who's, just been helped, who's just helped Sheffield Wednesday recently. Um, so he, he's obviously someone that knows how to play the game. Um, <sighs> who knows 
is the brutal, honest question, answer, really. Who knows? If Newcastle did get taken over by Saudis, it'll be unbelievable. If they don't, we just carry on. Um, and there probably might be another buyer. There's always been a few buyers after Newcastle, but I think, obviously, with everything that went on with the Saudis, it was basically the Premier League giving it a big green tick, saying, yep, yeah, that's absolutely fine. And then a transfer of funds. It was two little bits of uh, information away from a takeover. That's how close it was. A, transac- a transaction and a green tick, that's all it was lacking for Newcastle. But, um, yeah, we'll, see. we'll have to just wait and see what happens. But it wouldn't surprise me if we hear more about this at Christmas because it hasn't for the last three or four years. But I'll see it, I'll, I'll see it when it happens, basically. Sure. Is it frustrating that it, it? Do you almost want it to, if it's not going to happen, or just let just go away? And it's not an it's not a an option. Just it, that's not happening. Don't I don't hear about it. Just you can just carry on as they are. It's not it's not tempting you. It's not making you happy. It's, you know when when this sort of talk happens, I know as a as a United fan when something when, when we're linked to a big player, you think, oh come on, it's got to happen. Like Jaden Sancho, for example, I was thinking, oh my God, we're going to get him big sign. It didn't happen. Felt deflated after it. I think that's exactly. Yeah. Well, how is it? How is it for you guys? Because there's all this talk, and potentially you can have millions and millions of pounds put into the club towards transfers, and then all of a sudden it, it just collapses. How yeah, you- it, it's not great when you put it like that. I think for I think for us it was I think for Newcastle I think Mike actually wants to sell the club. A lot of everybody knows that Newcastle are up for sale, and that if it's if you put three hundred odd million on the table, you'll get Newcastle. Um, I think the the problem is because we all know that we there's a willing seller and now we've actually had a willing buyer, that's been the tough bit because Amanda Savy in particular has been after Newcastle for two, three years now. Mm. She's been she's been after Liverpool, couldn't afford Liverpool, she could afford Newcastle with a bit of help, basically. Um now I think for me she should just give it one more go and if it if if it if it doesn't work, then just call it a day because someone else needs to probably have a go at buying the club because Newcastle aren't getting anywhere with these unless something changes in court um, unless the Saudis come back in on the table because they know that Newcastle um, the sale of Newcastle can't happen now um, but as, as long as there's an offer on the table Mike Ashley will always listen um, it is frustrating it's the same like with a player as I've seen with Man United it was Jaden Sancho you, yeah. you're going to get them all transfer window and then it never happened so <laughs> It's tough. It's the same with us, but with a takeover. But um, never say never. But I, I'm not. I just I'm not getting my hopes up again because it was just too much last time. We all, I think, every Newcastle fan almost thought, yeah, that's it, because there was so many media out there saying that this is done. This is pretty much done now. Um, but obviously, it wasn't. That's football for you, man. Ups and downs and as a football fan. Um, Johnny, it's always great talking about Newcastle with yourself. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on, I think, for the third time or the fourth time on the channel. Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. There'll be no doubt we'll be in touch with you again. Because it's thank always, you very much. It's always good to talk about Newcastle and see how they're getting on in the season. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we'll Hopefully it'll be so after a win next time. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely, oh, hopefully. Thanks, Jonathan. Actually, just before just before Johnny goes, just make sure you go on to Newcastle Fans TV and check check out their channel. They they're massive on what they do. Me trying to promote you guys is probably silly because we don't have as many followers, but it will be fun. silly. <laughs> but yeah, definitely check the channel out. We'll put the link into the channel below as well. Johnny, thank you so much. Appreciate that, mate. No problem. Thanks for having me on, guys. Thank uh, you. Great to be joined there by Jonathan Greenwood from Newcastle Fans TV. Make sure you check them out as well. Make sure you subscribe to our channel, like our videos, leave some comments, just support us as much as you can so we can keep bringing you more content. We've got lots more coming up, so stay tuned. And we will see you next time.